Welcome, everyone, to a new edition of the Surma Pod. This is the podcast for the Sports and Entertainment Risk Management Alliance. I am the founder and CEO of Surma and your podcast host, Rich Lenkov. I'm going to start today's podcast with a trivia question. Uh, as a horror aficionado myself, I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit. There we go. Um, here's the trivia question. Who is the first character to wear the famous Friday the 13th mask on film? I'll let that sink in for a second. Maybe an obvious answer. You might think, well, it's obvious. It's Jason Voorhees, right? The character made, who, who made the mask very famous. You might think, ah, you know, he's asking me that catch question. Everyone knows, having seen Scream, and if you're a real fan of the movies, you know that the first killer in the Friday 13th series was actually not Jason. It was his mother, Mrs. Voorhees. But wait, that's not the answer either. How many of you knew that the actual first person to ever wear the famous hockey mask, one of the most famous masks of all time, certainly one of the most famous props of all time, is none other than the sh character Shelly, as portrayed in Friday the 13th, Part 3, Part 3D. None other than today's guest, Larry Zerter, who is a copyright attorney. Larry, thank you so much for joining us on the, pot, the Sermapod. Oh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Now, before we get into the scary litigation history of Friday the 13th and the recent news, we got to get into your backstory a little bit because uh, it's one of the most fascinating backstories of any attorney we've had the pleasure of having on our show. So okay. not only uh, have you been on various game shows, you're one of the few people I think who have been, uh, who have uh, worked with both Regis Philbin and the late Bob Saget, having been on uh, the Millionaire Show and also One Versus 100, coming, doing pretty well on those shows, right? As I might add. Uh, well, I, on, on the millionaire, I did not get to the hot seat, but on uh, one versus one hundred, I won the grand prize, uh, yes. beating out Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter and uh, ninety-eight other people. So that was pretty good. Right, beating Ken Jennings is no small feat. Um, in addition to that, you actually not only are you an expert in copyright trademark law, and in particular on this subject, you happen to have been, as I mentioned earlier, in the movie Friday the 13th part 3D and have been in various video games along the way. So it, how you got into Friday the 13th is an incredibly interesting and almost, you know, sort of old school Hollywood story. Tell our viewers and listeners how you came to play the character Shelley in part three. Uh, sure. So I, I was a 18 year old wannabe actor studying acting. I was a theater major in here in Los Angeles. Uh, college and uh, had a job on the weekends handing out uh, movie tickets to uh, sneak previews of movies. And I was in Westwood on a Saturday night um, handing out uh, tickets to a movie no one had heard of called The Road Warrior. And I was approached by two people who asked me if I was an actor. And I was, that was a strange question to be asked. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm an actor. Um, and they said, well, we wrote this movie and we think you'd be perfect for it. And it turned out I was pretty much exactly how they had pictured this character of Shelley, who's kind of fat and has a big afro and is dorky and a wannabe actor. And that sort of described me to a T. And uh, from that, I got an audition and I went in and auditioned and it was meant to be because I got the role. Um, and that's how I got to be in Friday 13th Part 3. So Shelley, as you mentioned, is not the uh, the most uh, socially adept character in the film series, but a very crucial character. Again, in the film, he is the prankster, right? He keeps um, pranking people with various uh, uh, images or, or various stunts, including his death by an axe at one point, uh, which is just a stunt. But it turns out that Shelley, who wears the hockey mask in Coming Out of the Water, to attack someone shortly thereafter is actually killed by none other than Jason Voorhees, who then starts to wear the mask. So again, hard to get your head around, but you are the first person to wear the famous mask on screen. Did you know at the time, I think I know the answer, but did you know at the time that this mask would become so iconic? Probably not. Yeah, there's just no way to know that it would become one of the most, you know, enduring symbols on film. I mean, you can show anyone that mask 
and and they will know what movie that is and that's that's pretty amazing i did know enough to ask if i could keep the mask uh <laughs> and was turned down um uh so uh but um you know no one knew it was going to be what it was and it turned out to be a a, a a big deal i do have my own replica i know you have one and i have one too that's the mask well let's see the inside of that oh yeah this is uh I've, it's, been autographed by everybody when I, I go out and sometimes I go to conventions and sign autographs. You know, so any if I meet another cast member, I, I you know, have them sign it. <laughs> so for our listeners, uh, Larry is showing us a replica of the famous hockey mask on the inside. It has Sharpie signatures from it looks like at least 25, 30, maybe more uh, uh, people, many of whom were, were in the various films. Now, I am a, as I mentioned, horror movie aficionado, and I'm an uh, avid collector. So I've got a Friday the 13th mask signed by, I think, about 12 actors, maybe 10 actors who have played Jason throughout the year. So I'm really proud of this. I've got also similar ones with a variety of other horror characters. Of course, Michael Myers, Pinhead. So I've got some great ones. But it's an honor to talk to the legend. So, Larry, let's talk about <laughs> the film and its uh, really interesting legal history because – it's really much. It's very much in the news. Uh, just a few weeks ago, on their Instagram account, New Line Cinema teased a possible reboot of the film, which fans have been clamoring for for years, and which hasn't happened because the parties have been involved in some pretty serious litigation. Before we talk about that, explain that litigation to our listeners. Let's go back to the beginning and talk about the two main um, uh, litigants here. Uh, that is Victor Miller and Sean Cunningham. Explain to our listeners and viewers who those people are and why they have been litigating this issue for so many years. Sure. Uh, so uh, Victor Miller is the credited screenwriter of Friday the 13th, the first one. Sean is the uh, producer and director of the first movie and all the other movies. And uh, they were uh, good friends. They had worked on some other movies before and after Halloween came out, they they literally said, "Let's make a ripoff of Halloween, <laughs> and uh, we'll set it on, um, uh, you know, in a camp." And I think Sean came up with the title Friday the Thirteenth, and they put up they put an ad in Variety um, saying, you know, going in production Friday the Thirteenth, and they had no, they had nothing at the time, they had no script, they had nothing, and uh, someone called them and offered them half a million dollars. To make it and that's it. they got their money and um the rest is history uh until <laughs> the recent lawsuits <laughs> so larry according to the uh copyright act of 1976 termination rights let creators reclaim their rights 35 to 40 years after assigning them that was at play here can you explain that a little bit more to uh our, our listeners and our viewers sure so uh the the copyright act is meant to protect people who sell their rights cheap and then those rights turned out to be a lot more you know worth a lot more uh down the road and so after 35 years they can cancel terminate the transfer and get those rights back uh a couple caveats it doesn't mean they they, they can stop the original movie anything made under the, the original grant can still be distributed um but uh, uh and it only applies in the u.s but it gives them the chance to go out and make new deals um, for stuff. And uh, so that's that's what happened here. Uh, there is an exception to the rule, which that it does not apply if the original uh, work was a work for hire. And that's the, that was the key issue in the lawsuit. Um, uh, Victor sent a termination notice and uh, Sean or Sean's company, which is called Horror, Horror Inc., um, sued, uh, asking for a declaratory relief that the original transfer, uh, could not be terminated because the work was a work for hire. And under the, the rule at the time, under the, that you had to have a, um, you had to have in the document, it had to say, this is a work for hire. You had to have those magic words. Or, uh, the person had to be your employee. And the the contract that Sean used for the deal, and by the way, Victor only got nine thousand dollars or ninety two hundred for the rights. Um, 
the contract did not use to have the work for hire language. So Sean's argument was that Victor was an employee and to prove you're an employee, the court uses a, a, a common law agency principles for law heads, you know, basically, well, do, do they act like an employee? Do, do they come to an office? Do, does the employer provide them with, uh, uh, with equipment? Do they provide hours? Are they paid, you know, by the hour or by the week or by the project? Are, how are they treated for tax purposes? Are they free to take on other work? Uh, the court looks at all these factors and makes a determination as to whether the determine you know whether the the person is an employee or an independent contractor. Uh, you know, so if, if you have people who work for you, you know, usually they're employees. They come every day. You provide them with you know a computer and a place to sit, and you tell them to work from nine to five. But if you hire someone to paint your house, they're an independent contractor. You're paying them a flat fee. They work when they want to basically and uh when they're done they're done uh in uh, victor's case the court uh, the lower court uh, had really no problem determining on summary judgment that victor was not an employee he he worked his own hours he worked at his own house he worked on his own uh i think it was pre-computer but he had, his, he had a typewriter and he worked on his own typewriter um he was not uh you know he was not given uh tax he wasn't uh, there wasn't any withholding done. It was just a you know a flat fee, um, and so for all those reasons, the, the lower court said that um, he was not an employee. He was an independent contractor, and therefore the termination was valid. Uh, that was appealed uh, to the to the Second Circuit, and who then uh, also upheld that ruling. Now it's been a year. Um, and said, yes, he, he's definitely an employee. There's not even a question of fact for a jury to determine. So at the moment, the way it works is that Victor owns the rights to uh, the original script in the US um, and Sean owns the rights everywhere else, over outside the US. And people sometimes say, well, you know, so if you're gonna make a new movie, what does that mean? Well, no one's making a new, first of all, if you're making a movie, you need, you know, no one's making a movie that will only be distributed in the U.S. or only be distributed outside the U.S. So for that reason, you need both of them to agree to come together. Also, no one's making a movie that is just, that is a word for, I mean, in theory, Victor could make a remake of the first movie and only release in the U.S., but since the first movie, The Killer is as we've said, it's Jason's mother, it's not Jason, and what people want is Jason with the hockey mask, and that is a, a, a combination of rights that the, the, the original Jason that Victor created in the first movie was just a little boy who drowned in the lake, and he's only seen in the movie for about 10 seconds. Um, and then the, the, the current Jason that we know, the unstoppable killer with the hockey mask, which is something that's developed over the subsequent 11 movies that came out. So to that point, Larry, you mentioned that uh, Victor sold the original screenplay for $9,200. Um, there's been 13 films. There's been video games. 12, 12, movies, 12 films. 12 films, uh, TV series, novels, comic books, uh, yeah, tie-in merchandise, right? Generated millions and millions of dollars versus this yeah. ninety-four hundred dollars. How much did the court, and in general, how much do courts consider the actual real-world implications of selling off this piece of intellectual property for a small amount when considering these kind of disputes? Well, in theory, it's 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 irrelevant. Right. Uh, the, the the issue is just was he an employee or not? Uh, because certainly there are lots of employees who create. You know, I mean, th that's the whole, the, the comic book world is full of that. People who are um, having that, that's the dispute that's going on in the comic book world where um, all of these people, you know, were in essence, because at the time in the pre-78 pre works, the, the you didn't have to have a work for hire agreement. You just had to be, it's what they call the instance and expense test. I don't want to get too wonky, but it, it's very hard to prove that you were not an employee 
it, for pre-78 work. So all of the stuff that was done uh, and uh, the comic book stuff, um, very hard to, to get that back. So they don't take that into account. <laughs> you mentioned about possibilities uh, in this case and in similar cases about use of the character and use of some of the intellectual property. You know, break that down a little bit for us. I mean, one of the arguments was that the original story, the original characters were far different from what really made money and shot the characters into prominence, which is the Jason that we know today, right? The series that we know today, which is a hockey wearing, hockey mask wearing, machete wielding superhuman that kills people. That wasn't part of Victor's original um you know, script, certainly. So how much does that argument play that the current exploitation is different from the original? Well, I, I've heard it made, but apparently, you know, no one is really taking it that seriously because if someone was taking it that seriously, then they would make movies without Victor's approval, and they're not. Um, at, at the end of the day, the Jason Voorhees, adult Jason Voorhees, is derived from child Jason Voorhees, from the original movie. And the author, one of the rights of copyright is the right to make derivative works and the right to create an older version of your character is, is, is one of those rights that the original author has. So even though that right was, you know, not written by Victor, in fact, there, you know, if people who aren't familiar with uh, the original movie, uh, what happens at the end, uh, you see there's two shots of Jason, one is him, uh, drowning in the lake, which is what sets off Mrs. Voorhees. And at the end, there's a dream sequence where he drags uh, Alice, the the final girl, into the water. Uh, in essence, his first kill. Uh, and and Victor didn't want that. <laughs> he was like, "Don't do that. that. That's a bad idea." Now that turned out to be a great idea. And um, so, but Victor didn't want it. But he he got the credit for the screenplay, so he gets the credit for Killer Jason and all of the all of the riches that fall, well, hopefully, eventually. <laughs> Larry, we're uh, a few weeks away from uh, the release, the early release, I might add, of Halloween Ends, right? Purportedly the last, although we know with good horror movies, they never really end, the last in the series of the current reboots of the Halloween franchise. I think it's coming yeah. out middle of October. Um, that has done tremendously well, been very successful financially, as have a lot of, both reboots, remakes, and original horror intellectual property. Generally, disputes like the ones we're talking about today end up being resolved, right? There's some deal that's worked out. These two litigants are well into their 70s, right? Their late 70s. 80s. 80s. 80s at this point. All right. So they have now given up years and years of potentially exploiting the value of this intellectual property to the tunes of millions and millions of dollars. Why did they not make a deal earlier and avoid all of this and make some money in their the later stages of their careers? Man, that is a good question. You know, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the fact is Sean has lot, all the money and Victor does not. So Sean doesn't need the money. He was, he, you know, he was in his late seventies. There's only so much more, you know, he, he had enough money to live on. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there are other people involved besides Sean. There, there are, there are other, so it's not just his, it's not just his decision at all. Um, but I don't know why they're being difficult. Although, you know, certainly the, the, the rumors now, are, and there's been some indications that they're close to making a deal besides the Instagram post, uh, Roy Lee, who is a producer at, uh, Warner Brothers and produced the It movies, um, has, uh, indicated that there might be a, a, a announcement soon um uh sean cunningham said there might be an announcement soon so i'm i'm hopeful that there will be an announcement in the next probably in october about uh, rebooting the franchise that they finally made some deal about it and larry again just to uh, underline one of the key components of this case i mean it really dealt with while there's a lot of you know interesting trademark copyright issues involved in this case it really hinged on this one issue of the employee, right? And the court ruled that because uh, Victor was a member of the Writers Guild, he availed himself of he availed himself of the benefits attendant to that labor union. Therefore, he shouldn't then be able to turn around and terminate uh, terminate the deal. 
Well, that was an argument that Sean's lawyers made that that failed. The the, the fact that 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 he was a Writers Guild member should have some that would mean that he's not in it, that he definitely is an employee. And the, the court said, no, that's not what, sure. that's not what it means. How uh, do the court deal, deal with that issue? They, they, they said there were two different areas of law. The, 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 the being a um, writer's guild member does not make you an employee for agency purposes, which is sort of the, 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 the common law or, you know, we're going to look at common law ways to decide if someone's an employee, not just are they a member of a union. And that's the right decision. I mean, this is the, the point is to protect people who, who, who sell these rights at, for, for pittance and get their money and, and then sometime later can get some more money and and we should be protecting these writers and our, you know, our thought, last yeah sorry go ahead well i i mean i'm just saying you know the the real thing is that there never should have been a lawsuit i mean i when he filed the lawsuit i i i said that sean was going to lose and and they just wasted five years and that, that's a lot of money they could have gotten that they, they it was a it was a long shot from the beginning that he was going to win this case. Last question, Larry, uh, here on the Sermapod. Uh, we know, again, as any horror film fan knows, that these characters are never really dead, right? I mean, they get killed and they come to life again. They get burned. They get dismembered. And somehow they pop up again in another film. My question to you is our favorite character in the series is, of course, Shelley, who you played. Even though his throat was slashed, <laughs> pretty definitively killed, might we see Shelley come back to life in the next installment of Friday the Thirteenth? We're all hoping for the answer, yes. But what do you think? Sure, you never know. Maybe an identical twin brother, Myron, Myron Finkelstein, who uh, yeah. who's out there just seeking to revenge Shelley's death. Maybe maybe you still have the wetsuit and the trident you were wearing. Where where are those? Those would be pretty good props today. Maybe I do have the the fake axe. I do have that. It's uh, it's, it's right above my head. I can you can't oh, wow. it's right there. <laughs> awesome. That's Larry Zerner, uh, noted intellectual property attorney. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about the very scary litigation history of Friday the Thirteenth, and hopefully what we'll see soon is another installment of uh, the Jason series. Larry, thank you so much for joining us on the Sermapod. Thanks for having me, Rich. My pleasure. Ideas, strategies, and opinions represented on this podcast are those of the speakers and do not represent the ideas, strategies, and opinions of their employers.